for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, rejoice. Be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And give light to all that are in the house. Let, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for this powerful portion of Scripture. Father, we read this passage and we see, first of all, our responsibility to you. And then we, we see, see our responsibility to our community and those around us. Lord, Lord help, help us to as we study to be learners, to be open minds, have open minds, open hearts. Lord, may we live our lives based upon what your word says. We pray for our country so desperately need the Bible. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, he was talking to his people. Personalize that. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, if you're a disciple, you are the salt of the earth. That means that we have influence. And he also says, You're the light of the world. If there is a place, if there is a source that the world is going to get by, it ought to come from you. It ought to come from us. You're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. So Christians are having influence. Now, stay with me. Stay focused. Tonight. Christians are to have an influence. All Christians. Now, we don't all have the same influence, we don't all influence in the same way, we don't all influence in the same place, but all of us are going to have an influence. We're going to have a positive influence in the world. And you know this, but, you know, salt, salt has flavor, right? That's why you pick up the salt shaker, periodically. Salt has flavor. Salt also has healing properties. Salt also preserves and protects. That's why, you know, that they would hang meat in the, the salt in the smokehouse. Salt preserves. You're the salt of the earth. Really, the most beneficial element, the most beneficial um, presence in our world is God's people, or God's people. That's why if you read the book of the, Paul, the epistle of the, the Thessalonica church that Paul wrote, he talked about what's going to happen when we're taken out of here. You think it's, you think it's crazy in this now? Wait till you take the salt out of the earth. Wait till you take the light out of the earth. 
So where did that influence? Where does the salt, where do we shine the lots? 14, 15, 16 in our text. And our lives should not be hidden. That's not talking about a self-righteous kind of a, a proud attitude about what we know and who we are. No, it's just letting our, our lifestyle should be distinctive. Where you work, your lifestyle should be distinctive. That doesn't mean we can preach all the time. It just means we are different. We, you know, we talked about this Sunday night. Jesus prayed for us and said, they are not of the world. We're not of this world. We're of a different world. I uh, hope you figure right here in Matthew, if you would, and go to the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2, where Paul is writing about the servant attitude that we should all have. And he says in verse 14, do all things, Philippians 2, 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, God's children, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Now, Paul wrote this to the Philippians, and the church there in Philippi, which is a part of Macedonia, that would be the region they were a part of. He's talking about a crooked and perverse nation, but this is true of every nation. It's crooked and perverse. In the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, look what he says in verse 15, among whom he shines his lights in the world. So I'm going to begin this matter of thinking about Christian citizenship and civil authority. Let's just talk about the influence we should have. That influence is not just in the, in the voting booth. And it's not just, and there's, and by the way, there's not, certainly nothing wrong with voting. I think we should. It's this, and it's not just in some protest that we are part of. And I, I think it's our constitutional right to protest. I think it is. But our, in, so it's called, the, our influence in the world, or our influence in our community, not just our influence in the church. And if, if that's being compromised, if that's being jeopardized, then, then we're going to have a problem. I love America for a lot of reasons. I love our country. And I, don't, I want to see our country survive. I want to see our country thrive. And the best thing, that, one of the best things that you and I can do is just live the Christ life. Flesh it out. Whatever the Bible says, live that life. And that influence will be realized. It will be realized in our, in our testimony. I began reading in verses 3 through 12 these Beatitudes, we sometimes call them, because it's talking about the life we're supposed to live. We're supposed to be poor in spirit and meek and Hunger and thirst after righteousness and merciful and pure in heart and peacemakers. And, you know, that's who we're supposed to be in life. And that's our Christ-like testimony. But not just, not just being Christ-like in our law, but also in our talk, our verbal witness, our verbal testimony. People need the Lord. And they need to see what a Christian looks like, the kind of, the, the fact that a Christian is honest at all times, in all circumstances, that we're generous, that we're selfless, we're not self-centered people, we're compassionate. That's what the world needs to see, because that's the way Jesus is. And the world needs to see that there are people who pattern their life after Jesus. So that we have a positive influence. We also have in the Bible, and I know you're familiar enough with it, I'm not going to turn to it, and I give you examples in the Bible of people who ought to have a good influence, but they, they have a negative influence. You know, you think about the notorious wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. And a vile region of the world. And you see several things in that. One thing we see is we see the the importance of intercessory prayer as Abraham prayed. 
interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he knew that Lot was there. And he prayed, beginning with this first plea with God. He stood before the Lord. If there be 50 righteous there, would you destroy it? If there are 50 righteous, well, what about 40 righteous? Well, what about 35 righteous? What about 20 righteous? What if there's 10? So we see this matter of praying and interceding. By the way, we ought to be praying for our country, for God's mercy. God is a merciful God. We ought to be interceding for our country. But we also see in that this pattern of a preserving the influence of the righteous. Because the Lord said, okay, if you find 20 there, then I won't destroy it. If you find 10, then I won't destroy it. The sad testimony is there wasn't 20 there. There wasn't 10 there. That's sad to think about, isn't it? I'm thinking, I'm thinking about us, though. I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm just thinking about we live in a perverse nation. We're interceding. And I think it's, I think it's, I think there is a valid sense that we can say that our life, our being salt and light in ways that we can't even measure, calculate, may be having a preserving effect upon our country. And we also see, of course, as I said, the compromise of Lot and his family. How they, they lost, lost their testimony. They, they lost, lost the respect of their family. family. They lost the respect of their friends. And, and uh, so, so we, we, we see the importance, importance of a good testimony being, being salt and light. We see, we see the, the negative influence of those who are not living righteous lives. And that's, and that's what Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 5, if you tell that in the Bible. Open there, there verse 13. Here's the salt of the earth. But if the salt had lost his, his savor, where it just shall it be salt? If it's, it's no longer salty, salty then, then how, how is, is the, the, how how's the earth going to be salted? salted? If the salt is, is no longer salty. salty. And, and, and I think, not, not in a judgmental way, but in a very realistic way, way we would have to say, and there are a lot of people claim to be saved, and they're not salty. They're not distinctively Christian. And that, that, that's, that's not minor. That's not, a, that's not a small thing. That's a major thing. We're not trying to influence the world that we live in. And so um, when it says there in verse 13, if the salt is lost in savor, it is therefore, it is thenceforth, it is thenceforth good for nothing. It's worthless. But to be cast out and drop on the foot of men. Now, if I picked up a salt shaker and I knew that that salt did not have a salty flavor, I wouldn't even bother to put it on my baked potato. Right? It's worthless. It's worthless. And if, and if, a, and and if a believer, not, not these are not my words, these are God's words. If a believer is not distinctive in the way they live, they're not fulfilling any valuable purpose in society. There's more to life than just having a family and the American dream and raising our kids and grandkids. There's more to it. We're going to be a positive influence in our world. So, so there's, there's no disputing the facts. This is just the sort of the introduction of the first point. There's, there's no disputing to me this fact. We're talking about the Christian's role in society. That we are to be a positive influence in our community, in our country. And I'm glad we can be. And we need it. And I'll just say this, I, you know, is this... I don't want this to be taken for more than, than what I need it to be. But I've, but I've never known an administration or any elected officials in my, in my lifetime that are, that are strong Christians as we have, have in places of responsibility today. today. <coughs> Daily prayer meetings in the, in the White House, House, that sort of thing. They don't broadcast a lot of reality. I'm glad for that. We need God's help in the 
higher, the highest places and the lowest places. So, here we, let's just think about where we are. And I'm just going to kind of wade into this. This is kind of a, a, in this introductory lesson. But as Americans, you know, as Christians in America, and I'm not, this is not a patriotic sermon, but as, but as believers, we have a very, very unique privilege to be citizens of this country. But there are a lot of things that ought to matter to us. Uh, for instance, the abortion issue should matter to us deeply. And I, I know people, you know, we, we tend to get used to things, but, but and this, is not, maybe this is not true in the last couple of years, but it was true for many years before that. Every time... You got your paycheck and you saw the amount of money that came out of your check. You can know that a certain portion of that is going to fund taxpayer funded abortions. Whether you like it or not, you're funding the murder of unborn children. Now that ought to bother us. You know what I'm saying? Those kind of things ought to concern us. And the, the legality, the recognition of same sex relationships. These things are, these things are, they grind on me. That, I, don't, I don't like it. You know what I'm saying? I just don't think it's a good thing. As a Christian, you know, when I, when I see, I'm just giving you examples. When I see that they're opening up the prison doors and letting criminals go free because they don't want them to get sick with coronavirus, but while they're doing that, they're writing citations to churches I'm telling you, there's something warped about that. And I'm not, I'm not on just a political stump. I'm just telling you, there's something twisted about that. And that ought to concern all of us. And I know there's some good teachers in the educational system. But many, I would say, public educators, whether it's in the, in the elementary school, the high school, the college age, they're, they're revising our history. They're rewriting history. They're promoting socialism and humanism and hatred for America. We're turning out of these educational institutions people that are anarchists. They hate our country. That's troubling to me. And then you think about stuff like, I could go on and on, human trafficking, those kinds. Of, it should not be. As a Christian, and, and shame on us, as a follower of Jesus, shame on us, if we just live as though those things don't matter, if they don't matter to us, who do they matter to? We're, we're believers. We belong to Jesus Christ. And the level of, of corruption, of dishonesty, of mistrust by the media and by the elected officials, it's off the charts. And my personal view is this, we need a revival. We need a spiritual revival, a revival of righteousness, and I think we need a revival of understanding that we're losing our country. And if nothing else, we ought to ramp up our praying for our country, for our leaders, for those kinds of things. Um, years ago, uh, many of you know that some people in our church started a like a Tea Party, patriotic activism kind of a group. And um, I used to quote Sam Adams a lot. Sam Adams was the founder of the Sons of Liberty, kind of an underground um, group that cared about biblical principles and, and, the, and our future at that time as colonists. But Sam Adams said this, if the time comes when vain men sit in the highest seats of government, now you're talking about a man in the 1750s, 1760s, 1770s. He said, if the time ever comes when vain men are sitting in the highest seats of government, America will need its experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. And I'm telling you, we have people in all place kinds of seats of government that are vain, self-centered, selfish, draining the system. And I'm so, 
as Christians, as Christians, we have a unique perspective. You still with me so far? We have a unique perspective. For one thing, this world is not our home, right? It really isn't. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to a different world. Our, we, are, we are taught in the Bible to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. We have a unique perspective. Our focus is on eternal things. We, you know, look not at the things which are seen, Paul wrote, but look at the things which are unseen. We have a different perspective. The invisible in our life takes precedent over precedence over the visible. So this is this is the world we live in. Paul lived in that world. Jesus, when he was here, lived in that world. But here's the question I have now, based on what we've already said. Does that mean that we have no responsibility? Does that mean we have no concern for civil matters, things having to do with society, things that relate to us as citizens? Does that mean that we're not to be salt and light? Does that mean we're not to have influence? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Those things are not, those things may seem to be contradictory. Jesus said we live for another world, but you're to be an influence in this world. We are to be an influence in this world. You know, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If you can find a nation who recognizes the Lord as God, that country will be blessed. Now, if God is the is the Lord of a nation, that means he's the Lord of people in that nation, right? And he is our Lord. And, and whether they realize it or not, America is fortunate to have you here because God blesses a nation who recognizes God. So think with me. Just put your thinking cap on. If God blesses a nation who acknowledges God, who recognizes God, who honors the Lord, shouldn't it trouble us when God is not recognized? When God is not honored? Shouldn't that trouble us? Sure it should. Now some of us, you know, some of us have been around for a while and don't have that much longer left in this life, but some of these little kids have a lot of, a lot of life ahead of them. And if God blesses a nation where God is the Lord, look at some of the nations of the world. Just look at them. Who don't know the Lord, they don't care about God. And look at what's going on in this country. It's, it ought to be very troubling for us. As Christians, we see things differently. Um, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Proverbs. And I don't think we'll be back in Matthew 5 this evening, but go to the Old Testament to the book of Proverbs for a moment. Proverbs chapter 29. I should have told you the chapter. I just thought y'all knew where we were going. Proverbs 29. Here's your good verse to mark in your Bible and think about from time to time verse 2 when the righteous are in authority the people rejoice but when the wicked beareth rule the people mourn now that's that's has to be from the perspective of a godly person I mean there are a lot of people that when the righteous are in authority, they mourn. And when the wicked are in authority, they rejoice, but that's not us. Now, there's a, there's a lot packed into that verse. For one thing, it matters what a person believes. When the righteous are in authority, whether they're a mayor of a city, whether they're an elected representative, whether they're a Supreme Court or a appellate court system, a judge, whether they're you know a cabinet uh, personnel and the administration when the righteous are in authority the people rejoice sometimes sometimes I'll see I'm not going to name any names but sometimes I'll see a 
a tweet or a post on the internet from one of those people that you see on the news almost every day. And, and then that tweet, they're talking about something they read in the Bible this morning. When that happens, I rejoice. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear through, the people mourn. Now that verse, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir tonight, but that verse should tell us something about the people we want representing us. Doesn't it, doesn't it to you? We want righteous people. You know, um, we, it, I, I'll be frank with you. I grieve over some of the people that are leading our country. I grieve over the prospects of certain people leading our country. And uh, it's, it's, you say, well, I don't think it ought to matter to us. I'm just telling you what the Bible says tonight. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with being happy when a person is elected to or promote are appointed or nominated to a position and they're a righteous person. It's a good thing. So again, here's my point tonight. Does it, does it sound to you, and, and maybe this will help you and maybe it'll help someone else that you can pass it on to someone, but it is, does it sound to you like we should have no interest in these matters? It doesn't sound that way to me. It, it sounds to me that we should be interested. We are to be light. We are to be salt. We ought to want righteous people representing us. It ought to grieve us when wicked people are making decisions for us. Now, does that mean that this is our primary interest? No, it doesn't mean that at all. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have a lot of things in our world that matter. We have families. We have occupations, jobs. We have ministries we're involved in, outreach and discipleship. We have evangelism and missions. We have all these things that are in our world that most of the world don't care about. They don't care about evangelizing and starting churches. and They don't care about those things, but we care about all those things. But there's a sense in which what we're talking about tonight, this matter of our country and this and the stability of our country, the direction of our country, there's a sense in which civil government will directly affect ministries and evangelism and things of that nature. We had a lesson on a Wednesday night uh, the, just the other day. I want to turn to that. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And um, this is a lesson. I think it was an online lesson Brother Jedediah Smith taught. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to, really dig into it, but just, I want to illustrate a point. While people say we should not get involved, we should not really care about those things, you know, politics doesn't matter to us, it doesn't really matter, God is sovereign, it doesn't matter who gets elected, but what the Bible says is different. And what the Bible says is that those things are going to directly affect our Christian lives. Look, for instance, in 1 Timothy 2 and you're very familiar with this, but it's about prayer first of all. I just want to read through it. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings. And for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. In all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He says, Paul says, We need to pray for those in authority. We need to pray for them that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Does that sound to you like it doesn't matter? This whole thing about civil government and and government authority and elected, does this mean, does it say that it doesn't matter? No, it says it does matter because we could live a peaceable life and God wants all people to be saved. 
this is this. I, I just want to make an illustration. I know it's a far reach, but if you if we could imagine, what if every nation in the world was led by God fearing people who believed the Bible and elected uh, people in elected office were trying to live by the precepts of the Bible? Wouldn't it be a better world? Wouldn't you have more people hearing the gospel? So I'm just talking about tonight, and the purpose of this introductory lesson is, has to do with our relationship to government and politics. And I am of the persuasion, and I know, I know this world, one of these days, is just going to come apart at the seams. I know that. I know there will be an antichrist, a one world dictator. I know that. A one world government is going to happen. But wouldn't any country be better off if you had more godly Christians, more people that were active as citizens promoting godliness? I think so. I saw, um, I didn't know this till yesterday, a friend of mine who pastors in another state, he announced yesterday that his wife is running for elected office. <laughs> and you know what? We need a lot of Christians in elected office. I'd feel a lot more comfortable if the people who feared God were making decisions for our families, local government, city council, school board, whatever it might be. And for those of you who were not around at that time, like I said, we, we invested a couple of years of our life along with everything else that we're doing. And we're not going to do this again, by the way. If you're thinking I'm fixing to launch a activist movement I'm not I'm just trying to teach a Bible lesson tonight but we spent a lot of time encouraging as Christians political involvement and spoke to many many groups uh, around our state churches training events I, I, I did training events in other states in Kansas and Alaska and um North Dakota, re, re, trying to in, register Christians to vote, get registered to vote, find out what people believe. We, we did door-to-door -door canvassing for conservative candidates because we, at that time, there was such a serious concern about what was around, around the corner. And we had meetings in the, we had meetings with our U.S. senators meetings with our U.S. representatives. I'll never forget some of those important meetings. L meetings in Jeff City with elected officials. But, but quite frankly, our level of involvement was not sustainable. <laughs> but it was a great experience. And I say all that to say this. Those kind of things are not wrong. It's not wrong to try to persuade people to be an informed citizen. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I was reminded of this a week or two ago because we had a primary election and we had several candidates running for uh, on the ballot for our governor and lieutenant governor and different offices. You're familiar with that. So, you know, all of us should vote. And I'm going to just pre present just a practical example of this. How do you know who to vote for? You know, and if, I, let me ask you this. How many of you spend at least a little bit of time trying to research and find out what these different candidates really stood for? Let me see your hands. Hold them up for just a second. Quite a few of us. How many of you go in there, you got four or five people on the can for the same office, who do you vote for? And you say, why do you say that? Because these people are being elected to very important offices. The governor of the state of Missouri, that's a pretty important office. One of the things that we used to do was we held candidate forums. We had so many of them in many counties. And we'd have all the people running for office come to sit down in a room. How many of y'all remember that? We'd sit down in a room and we'd be asking them the questions and they'd have to answer them. And people left there knowing where these people stood. You know what? It's usually not that way. I'm, I know I'm off my sermon a little bit, but, but how, how can you put righteous people in positions of authority when you don't even know who they are? You don't know what they stand for. 
And I want to I want to just conclude with something that I have believed for many years. And this all goes back to our responsibility to our country. And I think one of the greatest, and I put myself in this category, I think one of the greatest things working against Americans, but even Bible believers, is an apathetic attitude about this subject. It's just not that important to us. Just Let me just throw some figures out there for you to think about. And I, and I did research. I didn't just take one statistic or one group. But as a rule, about 60% of eligible voters actually vote. That means four out of ten people in America who could vote don't vote. Isn't that something? I mean, that's really something to think about. And that's in the, in the national election like this year. That's in midterm just much lower than that, far lower than that. After the 2016 election, there was the stati this statistic was published about the 32 largest and most um, developed countries of the world, countries like ours, large countries, not, not just undeveloped countries. 32 countries, and the question was, the, the statistic was, what percent of the eligible voters actually voted in the 2016 election? Of 32 countries, America came in 26th. That means we're living in the greatest country in the world that has opportunities and benefits and blessings greater than almost any place in the world. And out of 32 countries, we're number 26 as far as people who actually care enough to go out and vote. Now, that to me is alarming. Isn't it to you? And when I hear those things, I think, you know, there is such an untapped resource of people who aren't even involved in the process. Now, this is directly, this is not going to make anybody go to heaven because you get involved and but you know what? Indirectly, if it preserves our freedom, it could, have a, it could have a great impact on the future and missionary work and all these kinds of things. So I'm talking about just citizens now. But now let's get closer to home. What about Christians? About 90 million voting age Americans claim to be Christian. 90 million. As many as 40 million of those people won't vote in the presidential election. And that's something. 40 million people. Now you think about this. In the last election, there were 2 million votes that separated the two candidates for president. 40 million people who claim to be Christians aren't even bothering to vote. 15 million Christians aren't even registered to vote. Now, why do you say that? I'm just saying America's in a bad place. And I know we're a group, a small group of people and in a small, very small place. But I think people need, number one, to be aware of the fact that, that we have something to offer. Number one, we're to be salt and light in this world. We're, we're not, you know, I, I believe there is, I truly believe there is a silent majority of people who are decent people who want what's right for America who never really say anything or do much about it but first and foremost we need to be salt and light if we're not then we're contributing to our demise and that's just a call for us to live the Christ life the second thing is though if it if God wants righteous people to be in positions you say well I'm just praying God will put some a righteous person in there. I am too. But we ought to do something to, we ought to make sure we vote for the right. Find out what they believe. You know, get active or involved however you think you should. But I'm just saying, we, I think we're in a bad place in America. I really do. And I'm not being, a, I'm not trying to be negative and critical, but 
if, you've, if you think that our Christianity means that we should not be concerned about our country and the future of our country, then, and, and I'm, I'm, this, I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but I'd like for you to try to convince me and show me why I'm wrong about this. I think we ought to care about our country. I think we ought to care about doing what we can for our country. And we're going to be dealing with maybe the next lesson, this very important passage in Romans 13 that has to do with civil disobedience and our respect for authority. I think it's a very important passage. I want to deal with that and some other things. But tonight, I just want to say, if nothing else, let's get serious about praying for our country. God told us to. God told us to. And let's pray for God to put people in places of responsibility that are righteous, not wicked. Amen? Because I want to rejoice, not more. Amen? And as far as the other things, you may be sitting here and think, well, I just never took voting that serious. Well, again, the Bible doesn't say, you're to, you're, it doesn't command you to vote, but it does tell us that we're to do what we can to be an influence for righteousness in our, in our culture, in our society. We desperately, desperately need it. A reminder, and that is, if you think of something specific you would like for us to address in this teaching, in this series, write it down, give it to me, and we'll do that. Let's pray together, okay? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word that guides us. Lord, we, we have all kinds of personal opinions and ideas and preferences and inclinations, and we have uh, the influence of other people and what they say and think. And we have all these things. But Lord, we want to be guided by the word of God. And so we pray, not just in this lesson, but in the lessons ahead, that we, we could be balanced according to the scripture. What does the Bible say? We know, Lord, that we have other responsibilities and our time, our focus, is limited, so we pray that you'd help us to be good stewards and uh, give us wisdom, we pray. And tonight, tonight, Lord, we pray for those who are in places of leadership currently in our country, on a local level, in our county and state, in our country. We pray for these people, men and women, that you'd give them wisdom, you'd guide them. We pray that you'd expose corruption. We pray that truth might prevail. And we pray for our own lives individually, Lord, that we would be salt and light in this world. That we would be a positive influence in our culture, in our community.